I think there is a relationship between painting and film in that so many great directors have sought inspiration from painting and have created painterly tableaus, so to speak. But at the same time, I think Kubrick was really aware of what he could do that a painter couldn't. And he was conscious about turning that dynamic on its head. I think that historical art served a twofold function for Kubrick when he was preparing Barry Lyndon. On the most basic level, he wanted to be as accurate and authentic as possible. And 18th century portraits really served him in creating that effect of authenticity. But on a broader artistic level, he also really was inspired by the compositional devices of 18th century painting, the way figures are arranged together in suggestive groupings. Hogarth, Gainsborough, and Reynolds are really the dominating trio of 18th century British art. It's Hogarth who first establishes what we can describe as an independent British school of painting, and he does so largely through the genre of the conversation piece, which is a kind of group portrait, but in a setting and involving gestures, interactions among people that really tell a story, and more specifically what he called the modern moral subject. So he does a series of paintings in the 1730s and 40s, including the Rake's Progress, the Harlot's Progress, and Marriage a la Mode, all of which attempt to do in painting what contemporary novelists were able to do, to tell a moralizing tale of contemporary life with a lot of really juicy detail drawn uh, from social satire, social observation. And you certainly see that at some moments in Barry Lyndon that there are direct pictorial citations, for example, from Hogarth's Marriage a la Mode, in the famous scene where Barry is slumped in his chair, about to be challenged to the duel by Lord Bullingdon. I think that Hogarth's content was extremely influential for Kubrick, because Hogarth is probably the most cinematic of the 18th century British painters, if I can speak anachronistically. He wanted to tell stories in sequence, and many of his greatest paintings are part of series that tell the arc of a character's moral evolution and usually downfall. If we think of the Rake's Progress or the Harlot's Progress, it is this kind of picaresque tale that we see in Barry Lyndon of fleeting moments of worldly success followed by a gruesome downfall and usually some form of bodily disintegration or decay. Gainsborough, on the other hand, is an artist who is famous for both portraits and landscapes. In his portraits, he creates an image of supreme elegance and sophistication. And we really see that reflected in Kubrick's depiction of, of Lady Lynn, and she often seems to have just stepped right out of a Gainsborough portrait. But at the same time, he's also a wonderful landscape painter who observed the English countryside and its, its unique beauty in a way that would influence many artists to come. Reynolds practiced something that we call grand manner portraiture, which I think really characterizes the way that certain of the figures in the film are presented. They're shown full length, splendidly dressed, in a kind of swaggering pose that really conveys perfect aristocratic ease and nonchalance. Also, Kubrick appears to have been inspired by Reynolds' portraits of Sarah Siddons, who was the most famous actress of the 18th century British stage. And he reprises her depiction in his portrayal of Lady Linden, which is fascinating, I think, on a number of levels, because Sarah Siddons, of course, was not an aristocrat. She was an actress. So in a sense, Kubrick here is drawing on the portraits of an actress to structure the presentation of an actress playing an aristocrat. I also see the influence of a couple of other artists. George Stubbs is the most celebrated 18th century British animal painter. He really appealed to an aristocratic clientele whose life revolved around the hunt, around horses and dogs. And there's a direct pictorial citation of him in the image of the groom leading out the horse that will eventually kill 
Brian. And I think there's a wonderful irony in Kubrick citing this image of placid country life in the lead up to one of the most violent, upsetting passages in the film when, when Brian is tossed from the horse. Another artist whose work I think is really influential on Kubrick is Johann Zoffany. He is not a household name today, but he was one of the great practitioners of the conversation piece in the 18th century. And one thing he does that I think Kubrick really picks up on is the practice of meta-pictorial citation, if I can speak academically, that the paintings that Zoffany represents within his conversation pieces offer an ironic commentary on what's happening. And you really see that repeatedly in Barry Lyndon. One thing I love is the use that Kubrick makes of this so-called double cube room at Wilton House, this great English country house that appears in a number of scenes in the film. And one of the famous features of this room is a monumental family portrait by Anthony Van Dyke, the 17th century portraitist, depicting the Earl of Pembroke and his family. It's the classic dynastic image of the English aristocracy. And there are two wonderful scenes where this painting appears. In one, we see Barry and Brian huddled together at just one end of this enormous sofa underneath this monumental painting. And of course, there's an ironic commentary on these two upstarts who have inveigled themselves into this great English country house. And of course, there's the tragic contrast between the extinction of Barry's family line and the perpetuation of the family line depicted in Van Dyke's painting. And then Kubrick reprises this tension in the final scene of the movie where we see Lady Linden, Lord Bullington, Reverend Runt working through their financial papers, signing the annuity to Barry. And they're placed at this delicate desk that's at an odd angle in this enormous room. Again, this image of the ruin of the great family fortune contrasted with the image of dynasty and prosperity created by Van Dyke. I think you could characterize 18th century British art, at least some of its most famous practitioners, as practicing a selective realism. So we do, in conversation pieces, get a very accurate idea of how people dressed, the things that they owned, the interiors they inhabited. But I think we have to bear in mind that when people paid artists to paint their portraits, and that's the bulk of 18th century English painting that comes down to us is commissioned portraits. They wanted to put their best foot forward. They wanted to be presented in the best light. They were wearing their best clothes, and they may in fact have been wearing hired clothes or clothes that sprang from the artist's imagination. So the splendor that we encounter in those images, the material wealth, is only one side of the story and may in fact have been a bit of a fantasy. I don't think that Kubrick ever goes so far as to really confront us with the ugliness of 18th century poverty. We certainly don't have any views below stairs in the, in the servants' quarters. We don't even see the room that Reverend Runt, for example, would occupy at Castle Hackton, which would be much plainer than any of the interiors that we do see. What the devil is going on in here? I told you never to lay a hand on this child. At the same time, I think his interest is less in depicting societal violence, the exploitation of the poor, than in showing the violence within a family and the violence within military organizations. Kubrick was eclectic and had a very broad set of pictorial sources for Barry Lyndon that went far beyond the canon of 18th century painting. From what I've read of scholars who have done archival research, he was looking a lot at 19th century painting as well, particularly in trying to achieve the romantic emotional depiction of Lady Linden, something that there really weren't analogs for in, in 18th century portraiture. And in his depiction of light, the film seems to be looking much earlier to the 17th century, to the tradition that starts with Caravaggio and then continues in, in the Dutch masters, Rembrandt and Vermeer, of using light as almost a protagonist in the film. It's something that art historians would call studio lighting, where only one high window is open to direct a shaft of light into the space. 
and use it for very dramatic spotlighting. John Constable is a 19th century English landscape painter whose works do appear in Kubrick's archive of preparatory material for the film. He's famous in particular for his cloud studies, depicting these wonderful white fleecy clouds scudding across the sky in a way that you see again in the film. And he also uses a wonderful dramatic application of paint, something that would then influence 19th century French painters as well. But as much inspiration as he drew from 18th century art, Kubrick really was enjoying and exploiting the potentials of cinema, the things that a painter isn't able to do. She preferred quiet, or to say the truth, he preferred it for her. For me, the device of the zoom really runs counter to the experience of, of looking at a painting, and I think Kubrick was very conscious of that, that instead of giving us an all-over tableau where we have free range to look at what we want, he really wants to structure our experience of this tableau that he's created, and so he highlights the essential or suggestive detail, and then he zooms out of it to give us the full picture. The stillness and the tableaus and the sheer length of the film give us some different ways to participate emotionally in the film. On the one hand, you can take it as a purely aesthetic experience. You can really take the time to let your eyes wander over all of the sumptuous details, the costumes, the settings. But at the same time, Kubrick forces us to question that response by, at pivotal moments, insisting on the violence and tragedy of the story that he's telling. If you think of, for example, the repeated theme of corporal punishment, it's very disturbing the way over and over again we see men beating other men, men beating children, and he's really showing us the physical violence that keeps this societal decorum in place. So every time you're completely lulled into complacency by all the beautiful clothes and houses, suddenly you see blood and you're really brought up short. And Kubrick is very smart in the way that he arranges figures within the frame to express all sorts of tensions and repressed resentments, even at the same time as he's so fascinated with their decorum and comportment. And I think he's almost playing with that idea, arranging uh, these figures in almost still configurations that then, at pivotal moments, are so drastically violated. I'm, I'm thinking here of the recital scene that erupts into a brawl. <laughs> or when Lady Linden takes poison. And she's a woman who, up to this point, has been presented to us as almost a living Gainsborough portrait. And suddenly we're confronted with her anguish, her bodily reality, in a way that could never really be captured in, in a painting. <laughs> Barry Lyndon is never ambiguous about the fact that it is a work of art. It really embraces artifice in a very 18th century way and also embraces mediation and irony in ways that characterize 18th century painting as well. And that's one of the great pleasures of watching the film. One that remains somehow timeless and ageless. <laughs> <laughs>